Welcome everyone to this online book talk organized by the Norwegian Network for Asian Studies and broadcast from the House of Literature in Oslo. My name is Helena Ramnes and I am a coordinator for the Network for Asian Studies. We are a Norwegian research network promoting studies and research on Asia and sharing knowledge about the region's history, society, culture, politics and the environment. <coughs> we are delighted to have award-winning author Jung Chang with us today. She will talk about how she became a writer before discussing her latest book, Big Sister, Little Sister, Red Sister, Three Women at the Heart of 20th Century China. We also have Professor in China Studies at the University of Oslo, Mette Halskov Hansen, with us, and she will continue the conversation with Jung Chang about her book. Towards the end, we will have a short Q&A session and we encourage all attendees to post their questions in the chat in the live stream. Without further delay, I will again wish you welcome and pass the word to Jung Chang and Mette. Thank you. Uh, hello. Now, um, well, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, and um, I'm, I'm delighted to be here. Um, to talk about my latest book, Big Sister, Little Sister, Red Sister, Three Women at the Heart of 20th Century China. And before we get on to the three women, I'd like to say a few words about how I became a writer. <clears throat> I loved writing when I was a child. But when I was growing up in China in the 1950s, 60s, and the 70s, it was impossible even to, even to dream of becoming a writer. Because in those years, um, in Mao's incessant political campaigns, nearly all writers were persecuted, you know, sent to the gulag, driven to suicide, um, and some were executed. Even writing for oneself was dangerous. I, I remember I wrote my first poem on my 16th birthday in 1968. It was in the middle of the um, Cultural Revolution and books were burned across China. I was lying in bed polishing the poem when I heard the door banging the Red Guard had come to raid our flat. And if they saw my poem, I would get into trouble and my family would get into trouble. So I had to quickly rush to the bathroom to tear up the poem and flush it down the toilet. And that, did, that ended my first venture in writing. But the desire to, to write never left me. In the following years, I was exiled to the age of the Himalayas and worked um, as a peasant, a barefoot doctor, and then later an electrician. And when I was spreading manure in the paddy fields, and when I was um, checking electricity supplies, on top of the electricity poles, I was always writing in my head with an imaginary pen, but I couldn't put pen to paper. And then in 1976, Mao died and China began to change. And in 1978, for the first time since the communists came to power, scholarships for going abroad were awarded on academic basis. I sat for a national exam, I did reasonably well, so I became one of the first group of 14 people to come and study in Britain. And I was so lucky because the door was just beginning to open. And when I got my doctorate in linguistics in, at the York University in Britain, I became the first person from communist China to get a doctorate from a British university. Now, when I arrived in Britain in 1978, I could write 
But it was at that moment, the desire to write left me. <clears throat> because I had come to a completely different world. Everything was new. It was like landing on Mars. And I just wanted to spend every minute absorbing this new world. To write for me would be to look backward and inward into a past I wanted to forget all about. And in the Cultural Revolution, my father, spoke up to Mao, and um, he was imprisoned, tortured, driven insane, sent to a camp, and died very tragically and prematurely. My beloved grandmother, who brought us up, died. Um, and my mother went through over a hundred of these ghastly denunciation meetings, and facing, she, she was facing a hysterical crowd um, and made to kneel on broken glass. She was paraded in the streets when children spat at her and threw stones at her. Uh, but she survived. And But this past was, uh, I, I just wanted to forget all about. And so the last thing I wanted to do in Britain was to write. Uh, <clears throat> so I, I, I also, I was having a, terrific time. You know, I was the first person from communist China, um, I dare say, to do many things which were forbidden at the time. Um, I mean, for example, to go into an English pub, um, because the Chinese translation for pub, jiu ba, suggested somewhere indecent with nude women gyrating. You know, this was in those days. And so we were told not to visit a pub, but I was torn with curiosity. So um, one day I sneaked out of the college, I darted across the road um, and uh, there was a pub. I pushed the door of the pub open. Of course, I saw nothing of the kind, only some old men sitting there drinking beer. And I was rather disappointed, of course. Um, so, and so I spent 10 years in Britain. And 10 years later, my mother came to China to stay with me. For the first time, she told me the stories of her life and stories of my grandmother and her relationship with my father. And once my mother started, she couldn't stop. And she stayed with me for six months and she talked every day. By the time she left London, she had left me 60 hours of tape recordings. And when I was listening to my mother, I kept saying to myself, I've got to write all this down. And then, and then I realized how much I wanted to be a writer and how much I had always wanted to be a writer. And it also seemed to me that my mother seemed to know that I had this unspoken dream and she was helping me to fulfill the dream because I mean, when I was out working, my mother talked into a tape recorder. And so after my mother left, um, I sat down and transcribed her tapes and I um, opened the door in my mind to my past. And I wrote Wild Swans, which was published in 1991 now 30 years ago. <laughs> um, and while Swans changed my life and um, I became a writer. After that, I wrote a biography of Mao with my husband, John Halliday. We spent 12 years writing this book. We went to all the available archives around the world and interviewed hundreds of people who knew Mao, who had interesting dealings with Mao, um, who were the historical witnesses. Um, and um, um, then I wrote a biography of Empress Dowager Cixi, the last great royal ruler of China, um, who, as an imperial concubine, who brought China into the modern age. She died in 1908. 
Um, and then after that, I, after I wanted to find out what happened in China between her death in 1908 to 1949 when Mao seized the power. Because when she died, her last project was to turn China into a constitutional monarchy with an elected parliament. She was going to give the Chinese the vote. And yet, 40 years later, Mao seized the power and plunged China into a totalitarian abyss. And, um, and then, I, then the three Song sisters from Shanghai and their husband, Sun Yat-sen, the, the so-called father of China, or, because he was the first person to advocate republicanism. And his successor, Chiang Kai-shek, the ruler of China before Mao, their stories are the stories of China in those 40 years, and far more both before the years, in fact, and after. And in fact, their stories is the story of China in the, in, in the 20th century. And, um, um, and so now I'm just going to show um, some pictures to illustrate the, um, to give you a short introduction to the three Song sisters. Okay, now this is the, the cover of the English language um, of the book. And um, the woman sitting in the middle is their mother, an extraordinary woman, big sister Eileen standing to her right and the red sister Qingling standing to her left. And their mother, Ni Guizhen, came from the oldest Christian families in China. And in fact, a district in Shanghai is named after her family. And that's their father, Charlie Song. Um, and Charlie also had an extraordinary life. He went to America in 8, 1970, sorry, eight, in, in the eight, late, 1870s as a sort of a coolie, but he didn't want to lead that kind of life. So he fled to the south of America and um, he was um, he converted by the Southern Methodists and became the first Chinese to have been converted um, as a Methodist. He spent seven years in America um, studying Christianity, and then he went back to China as a preacher. And some years later, he gave up um, the preacher job um, and went into business, and he made a lot of money. And with the money, he most wanted to send his children to America to receive an American education. He wanted to send his three daughters as well as sons to America. Uh, <clears throat> now let's go stay with Charlie for a minute. Then his eld eldest daughter, Eileen, big sister, went to America in 1904 at the age of 14. She became the first Chinese young woman to go from China to America to be educated in America, in, in Georgia. Red sister, the second sister, um, Qingling, also studied in America. And then when she came back to China and she to the east and at first in Japan, and she fell passionately in love with Sun Yat-sen here with her. In the, this is one of the the pictures together, and she was madly in love and she wanted to marry Sun Yat-sen. And she, at the time they were in, in Japan, but she went back to Shanghai to ask permission from her parents. And they were 
absolutely refused to let her marry Sun. Mm, I mean, obviously, Sun was more than twice of her age, but Sun was also married with a wife and children and concubines and many other mistresses. And basically, Sun was a womanizer. Mm. So their parents didn't want her to marry Sun Yasian, and they locked her up in her room. But she climbed out of the window and boarded a ship to go and marry Sun Yasian in Japan in 1915. <coughs> Sorry. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> but a few years later, she was totally disappointed with Sun Yat-sen. And, and uh, at the time, they were, they were surrounded by Sun Yat-sen's political enemies. And she, very much in love, wanted to die for him. And she offered to stay behind to cover Sun's escape. So Sun Yat-sen fled. But what she didn't realize was that after he arrived in safety, he still didn't want her to leave. He wanted her to stay there to draw enemy fire and to encourage the enemy to, to escalate the fire into a war, a battle, a big battle, to give him the ex an excuse to fire back and for his political goals. And so she nearly died. And she, during her own flight, um, she um, several times she nearly died. And she suffered a miscarriage and was told she could never have children again. And, and she was a heartbroken and totally disillusioned and um, fell out of love with Sun Yasian. But she didn't want to leave him. What she wanted to do was to do deals with him, with him. And the deal she had in mind was to become a political figure in her own right. Because at the, at the time, no wives, no political wives were allowed to, to be seen in public as a, a political figure. But she did. Now, <clears throat> this is her with Sun Yat-sen standing behind the desk in 1924 at the opening ceremony of the Wang Po Military Academy. Now, Sun Yat-sen's biggest dream was to become the president of a Republic of China. But at that time, when the Chinese Republic was founded in 1912, China was trying to practice democracy. Um, but Sun Yat-sen realized that he couldn't get the vote and he couldn't get the parliament to obey him. What he wanted was to give orders and be obeyed. But he realized the parliament wouldn't be obey him. So he wanted to start a war um, to attack Beijing and overthrow the democratically elected parliament. I mean, a very or no, completely unknown fact, or extremely unknown fact, is that China was a functioning democracy between 1912 and 1928, when Chiang Kai-shek leading the army built by Sun Yat-sen overthrew the democratically elected government in Beijing. Now, Sun Yat-sen couldn't get the West <clears throat> to support his um, dream. And so he turned to Soviet Russia. So Soviet Russia then built him an army, supplied him with arms and lots of money and built this Wang Po Military Academy. And Chiang Kai-shek here to the right of Sun Yat-sen was the head of the, of the military academy. He led Sun Yat-sen's army. 
Chiang Kai-shek at the time pretended he was a pro Russia and he was pro communism. But in fact, he was totally against communism. So after Sun Yat-sen died in 1925, Chiang Kai-shek split from the, from the Russians and split from the Chinese communists. That was in 1927. And the three sisters were um, pictured together. And this was perhaps the last really happy picture, the three sisters taken together. And big sister Eileen sitting in the middle with um, a little sister Mei Ling and standing behind her and red sister Qing Ling in dark Chongsan also uh, sitting behind her. Um, <clears throat> soon after Chiang Kai-shek split from the communists, the three sisters were thrown into two antagonistic political camps. The big sister and the little sister were passionately against the communists. So they went with Chiang Kai-shek. Red sister Qing Ling um, was converted to a, to a Leninist by the Russian advisors sent to help her husband Sun Yat-sen. So she was a communist and the other two were anti-communist. And little sister Mei Ling married Chiang Kai-shek in December 1927 in Shanghai. And this is the, the couple on their honeymoon. But Mei Ling soon sank into a depression for seven years. And this was because she didn't realize life with Chiang Kai-shek was like that. I mean, she never thought it was like, like I mean, the li real life was very different from the life she dreamed of. Um, Chiang Kai-shek basically started his political career as an assassin. He assassinated Sun Yat-sen's main political rival. And that's why, that's how he caught Sun Yat-sen's eye and eventually became Sun Yat-sen's successor. And as a result, um, Chiang Kai-shek and his wife were pursued by assassins. Some got into their bedroom. And as a result, Mei Ling suffered a miscarriage and was never able to have children like her sister. Chiang Kai-shek loved his wife and wanted to pull her out of depression. So in 1932, <clears throat> he gave her a birthday present. It was a necklace, but it was no ordinary necklace. As you can see, it encircled a whole mountain. Chiang Kai-shek imported these French pine trees to form the chain of the necklace. The French pine trees color differently in late autumn from the local trees, forming um, a distinctive, <clears throat> sorry, forming a distinctive chain. The jewel on the pendant is actually a villa called the Mailing Palace. The villa has blue tiles um, on the roof, which sparkle in the sun, looking like a real jewel. <clears throat> now, big sister Eileen was the person who brought the Chiang Kai-sheks together. And, and she, she was a very smart woman and was Chiang Kai-shek's unofficial advisor. So as a result, she made her husband, she became one of the richest women in China. And she made her husband, H.H. H. Kong, Chiang Kai-shek's prime minister and the finance minister for many years. And meanwhile, red sister Qingling 
went into exile in Russia. Here she is with her fellow exiles. The man to her left is called the Deng Yanda, who was a very smart man with leadership qualities. In fact, he so impressed Stalin, and Stalin asked him to be the leader of the Chinese Communist Party. But he said, you know, he didn't believe in communism. Um, and as a result of, you know, rejecting uh, um, Stalin's um, offer, he fled to Berlin and Qingling followed him there. And um, Stalin then made Mao, Mao Zedong, the leader of the Chinese Communist Party. And these two, Qingling and Deng Yanda, fell in love in Berlin. And Deng Yanda wanted to form a third party, different from the communists and the nationalists. And he went back to China in 1930 to form this party, and he became the biggest threat to Chiang Kai-shek. And so Chiang Kai-shek had him arrested and secretly executed. Qing Ling lost her love, her, you know, her only love um, after, you know, this after her heartbreak with Chen, Sun Yat-sen, and she hated Chiang Kai-shek, and she vowed, and she did spend the rest of her, well, her life in overthrowing Chiang Kai-shek, even though they spent disaster for her entire family, including her sisters. Now, the war against Japan started in 1937. Meiling at this time was China's first lady, you know, after Chiang Kai-shek overthrew the Beijing government and they established the nationalist government in, 19, in 1928. And here she is doing her duty as a first lady, visiting wounded soldiers. <clears throat> she toured America um, triumphantly in 1943. And here she is addressing Congress and the standing ovation lasted many minutes. And here she is at, at a Hollywood Bowl, uh, sitting on the front row with a bouquet on her lap. And the man <clears throat> to her right is David, her nephew, the, the son, eldest son of big sister Eileen. Of the three sisters, only Eileen had children. She had four children, two boys and two girls, and basically, Eileen loved her little sister, and she gave a boy and a girl to little sister Mei Ling to be raised as her own. And the the the, the person to the on the other other side to the farm to her left um, is her niece Jeanette. Jeanette was gay. Um, but unusual for her time, she didn't try to hide the fact, and she flaunted it. Um, she always dressed the immense clothes and, and wore men's hairdo. So when they were in America, President Roosevelt called her my boy. <clears throat> um, Mading and Chiang Kai-shek at a Cairo conference um, with wrote President Roosevelt and the Prime Minister Winston Churchill. Now the war, during the war, there was a united front and the three sisters came back together. And this was um, the three sisters with Chiang Kai-shek in, in Chongqing <clears throat> during the war. And you, you may notice that red sister Qingling um, kept a distance from the other three. She also made sure that she never smiled when Chiang Kai-shek was in the picture. And the three brothers here with their wives, we'll skip their stories. Now, after the war, 
Chiang Kai-shek's portrait was hung on Tiananmen Gate, where Mao's very near where Mao's portrait is today. <clears throat> but the communists and the nationalists um, soon started a civil war for the control of China. Mao's communists beat Chiang Kai-shek. And this was January 1949, just before Chiang Kai-shek was thrown out of mainland China and flew to Taiwan. Here, he looked very sad, walking out of his family temple. The man to his right, <clears throat> the man on the front with a hat, is his son, his only blood son, Qing Guo. Qing Guo was Chiang Kai-shek's, as I said, only blood son <clears throat> and heir. Uh, so as a result, he was kept as a hostage in Russia by Stalin for 11 years. And he was thrown into a gulag and, and did some other hard labor and basically kept as a hostage for Stalin to extract what he wanted out of Chiang Kai-shek. Chiang Kai-shek, <clears throat> Chiang Kai-shek was desperate to get his son back. Um, um, so he offered a deal with Stalin. He traded the, the return of his son with the survival of the communists and the Red Army. At a time when he could have wiped out the communists, particularly in the 1930s, during the long march, and he let them go. So as a result, the communists survived and became very, and grew and uh, drove Chiang Kai-shek to Taiwan. But he got his, Chiang Kai-shek got his son back. Qing Guo became the ruler of Taiwan after Chiang Kai-shek died in 1975. It was he who put Taiwan on the path to democracy, which Taiwan is today. And the Chiang's eating under Chiang Kai-shek's portrait and red sister Qingling on Tiananmen Gate and the, the shorter <clears throat> woman, and on Tian, she, she's on Tiananmen Gate with Mao and with Zhou Enlai to her right and Deng Xiaoping to the right of Zhou Enlai. And she was Mao's vice chair and she collaborated with the communists for the rest of her life um, until her death. And here she is, the shortest, and on Tiananmen Square, in the row of the leaders in 1976 um, at Mao's memorial service. You may notice the gaps in this row of um, communist leaders. And um, these were the places for the Gang of Four, Mao's four assistants, led by his wife, Jiang Qing. When the picture, when, sorry, when the picture was taken, when the memorial service was held, they were still in power, very much in power. But by the time the picture was published, they were gone, you know, gone to prison. And so there was nothing the editor could do but to airbrush them out of the picture, leaving conspicuous gaps. Uh, <clears throat> And you may wonder what Elvis is doing um, with uh, the story of the Song Sisters. And the lady he was holding is Deborah Paget, a ho Hollywood actress and the leading lady in Elvis's first film, Love Me Tender. And uh, um, Deborah Paget, um, apparently, um, uh, Elvis proposed to Deborah Paget, but Deborah turned down the king to marry <clears throat> to marry Eileen 
big sister's youngest son. <clears throat> And here she is, Deborah Paget, um, and with with me, and and um, and um, also the son, the only son of um, Deborah Paget and um, and Eileen's um, youngest son, and he's called um, uh, Greg. Greg is the only blood descendant of the three Song sisters. And mailing little sister around age 100. And she um, lived to see three centuries. She was born in 1898 and died in 2003. Um, so she lived to see three centuries. And this is just a brief, um, just their stories in half an hour. Thank you. for this uh, amazing story. Uh, thank you also for first giving us some insights into your own life, uh, your own travel from living through <coughs> some of the terrible experiences you had through in the Cultural Revolution and then eventually becoming a writer who is uh, read by millions of people all over the world. Uh, you are a very influential writer. You are also a highly loved writer. Uh, I was a student uh, in China in, uh, from 1986 uh, for two years. So at that time, of course, uh, we had to read uh, history books and other books about uh, China. Uh, and yet, when your book, uh, Wild Swans, that you also talked about, when it came out in 1991, uh, it really made a huge impression on me. Uh, I was very captured by it, as so many other people were. Uh, and I read it very quickly, and uh, and and it really it really has uh, stayed with me. Uh, and I think one of the reasons uh, why it was so so influential on me at that time, and has stayed with me, is really that you have this ability to connect these historical events with real people's lives, uh, and especially the fact that you 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 give these very lively and personal images of women uh, who become not just victims of society and history, but agents. <laughs> and I think uh, there are not so many of them in, in, in standard history books, uh, or at least maybe at that time there were not so many of them. Uh, and I think also this recent book of yours that you have been presenting so uh, lively to us now, uh, I, I also think the individuals really stand out. Uh, both the sisters, uh, who are undoubtedly the three most famous sisters in, in Chinese history, but also some of the other historical figures, uh, Sun Yat-sen, Chiang Kai-shek, uh, they, ha they suddenly have real lives. They have feelings and thoughts. Uh, many of them are maybe not so familiar to most of us, but some of them are, and they, they come out as real human beings. So I was thinking about this style in which you write. Uh, I guess it's biography, it's history, but I also wonder, is there also a level of fiction in it? Uh, it seems to me to be able to write in this way, you need to mobilize somehow your own experience, your own emotions, and, and project them into these people. Uh, but I don't know how you see it. Is, there, is, there a, is it biography? Is it history? Is it, is it also a high level of creativity and some elements of fiction in, in the way that you write? <coughs> Well, there is no fiction. I mean, they all my books start from Wild Swans to the three biographies, um, and there is abs absolutely no fiction in, in the in my books. My books are non-fiction. Um, I think maybe one one thing is I do very thorough research. If I may say mm -hmm. this to myself, I love research. I love working in the archives. I love going through mountains of stuff, interviewing people, to get to the bottom of of things. I I am curious. You know, I wanted to know what happened. Um, <clears throat> I mean, the biography of Mao took my husband, John Halliday, and me, two people together, 12 years. And, and we, I mean, it's from that vast um, source 
different sources and that um, you know we boil down to the book the Mao biography and similarly I did research um, six years of research and writing for the for Emperor for the Empress Dowager um, um, I, just mountains, just mountains of research. Then you will find, really, as they say, um, you know, life is a stranger. Uh, truth is a stranger than fiction was. What's mm. the effect? Um, <clears throat> and um, with the, the three sisters, again, years of research, and this time the research is take, uh, took shorter time, and this was because the, the, there were many overlaps. Um, many areas I had already researched in the Mao's to do with Mao or to do with Empress Dao Jitsu Shi. But, um, but um, on the whole, you know, years of research. And I, uh, somebody said, <laughs> and why, said, you know, I was like a, like a vacuum cleaner, <laughs> you know, taking, you know, hoovering in um, all the bits. And from these all the bits, um, then this other maybe, if I may say, maybe the quality I, I find in myself is I think I have an eye for for this for, for story writing. Um, I, I, am, I am able to sort of to um, to form a dramatic narrative um, and to make um, to to make it even look like it was like a fiction but down to the you know the color of the clothes the style the whether somebody was a was smile or there was where there was a frown um, and all these had had sources so my original drafts and um, every sentence has many um, has many notes. Yes. Um, now, of course, these notes are distilled, and but they are there in the book, and in some cases, um, they are on the website um, for people to consult. Mm. So one of the things that, that struck me uh, when I first started uh, reading your book, and indeed, you get, I got very quickly into the book, precisely because you are a very strong storyteller, so it's very easy to, to get into, into the book. Uh, but one of the things that struck me, because I was now prepared when I opened the book to read about the three sisters, and then I found that mm. in the beginning especially, the men, they take up a lot of space. Sun Yat-sen, Chia Li-sung, Jiang Kai-shek, Zhang Xiu-liang, then afterwards comes Stalin, Mao. I mean, the men, the men are important in the book. And there's nothing wrong with that at all. Uh, and I guess for those of us who have read a lot of academic books uh, about China, we are, we are sort of, they are basically inhabited by men. And then a uh, few wicked and evil-minded women, <laughs> like uh, for instance, Dowager Tzu, she is sometimes presented like that. And it's sort of understandable, but I was still wondering if you found <laughs> the need to start out framing the story of the sisters towards these men, or if there was another thought uh, behind, uh, especially the first, I don't remember, it's four or five chapters, if there's another thought behind this very strong uh, presence of uh, the men. Well, first of all, the three sisters did not change history. Mm. And the history, um, China's history was like that. Um, I mean, actually, thanks to, to start with modern China, thanks to Empress Dowager, so she, um, she was a woman, but even she had to rule behind, um, behind the throne in the name of her son and an adopted son. And at her time, um, the, the three sisters' time, then Sun Yat-sen was the most important man. He decided on which way China went, which is not towards democracy, but towards dictatorship. And Chiang Kai-shek, was the first dictator of China. I mean, so because of the importance of history, as you mentioned, of my book and of my books and the relationship between history and the characters of my books, um, it's inevitable. I have to give the emphasis to these men. Um, <clears throat> and so I guess, you know, another person 
could have written the book differently with the three sisters. I mean, but for me, because history, their stories are important to me, partly because of history, who mm. they, uh, the role they played in the history. Mm. So I, um, I gave the men um, very important, prominent uh, presence mm. in my book. Now, there is also another reason, <laughs> which is I started wanting to write a biography of Sun Yat-sen. So I'd already <laughs> written the first paper. <laughs> and I, I, because after Mao and um, Empress Dowager Cixi, I had wanted to write another policy maker, a man who decided which way history went. And Sun Yat-sen was the obvious candidate. Mm. So I started research at the CSN. I did a lot of research, and then I, then I, you know, I got, I got, um, I got bored with him, and I just, um, I just thought, here is another man whose only purpose in life was power, and it was like another Mao, only he didn't get to rule China, um, and um, and the, and they were so single-minded you know, pursuing their goals mm -hmm. and their life became one Sun Yat-sen's life most different yeah. mm -hmm. Sun Yat-sen's life became quite one-dimensional and um, so I, I felt I, then I didn't want to devote another book to him mm -hmm. but during my research the three sisters whose biography I actually had resisted writing before and that's another story but I had resisted writing the story of the three sisters and then I realized how interesting their lives were through my research into Sun Yat-sen and then I realized you know they were political figures but they had other dimensions they have loves hates you know heartbreaks betrayal, um, close shaves with death, um, um, you know, passionate love, <clears throat> everything. I mean, I, I then changed my mind and I switched the subject to the three sisters. Mm. And of course, with Sun Yasi and Chiang Kai-shek both being very important. But the first chapter, then, then I, then, you know, several years had gone by <laughs> down that route. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, the first chapter, um, and, and then it, it became that of um, Sun Yat-sen. But it's also quite difficult because I, if I had written another way, you know, make the three sisters in the first chapter, because their life was linked their prominence was primarily because of Sun Yat-sen and the, because Red Sister Qingling married Sun Yat-sen that led to the whole thing to uh, Mei Ling marrying Chiang Kai-shek to the whole family fortune and the family importance so I then I I, I was so deep into my work and I I felt um, there is no way I can write it another way. Mm. So it becomes what, what it is today. But I hope Sun Yat-sen's story um, is, not, is not boring. He's, not, he, he's actually very interesting. He's just not the subject for a whole book. Mm. But as for a few chapters, I mean, he was quite interesting. And Chiang Kai-shek. Um, let, me, let, so, let, us, let me stay a little bit with Sun Yat-sen. <laughs> Because I think okay. maybe maybe one of the things that will come as a surprise for at least some readers of your book is that mm -hmm. uh, maybe those who are f uh, familiar with some versions of uh, China's revolutionary history will be surprised. Because Sun Yat-sen, as I see him mm -hmm. in, from your book, he really stands out as uh, actually quite a coward, uh, a selfish, self-aggrandizing man. Uh, I don't think there's nothing really charming or even fatherly about him. Um, and I must confess that I almost had to laugh at a fantastic quote from uh, the younger sister Mei Ling, who you describe at some place as you call her a tiger, tigerishly strong-willed and independent woman. And she at some point, and th this was in 1919, she <laughs> said, uh, and I now quote from what Mei Ling said, she said, do you know, I have noticed that the most successful men are usually not the ones with great powers of geniuses, 
but the ones who had such ultimate faith in their own selves that invariably they hypnotize others to that belief as well as themselves, unquote. Uh, that was from 1919. I guess hmm, you could use that quote for some, for some leaders a uh, hundred years I later. Also. Yeah, yes. <laughs> uh, yeah. Is yeah. this also, do you agree with my link? Is this also how you see the main characters, uh, many of the main male characters, Sun Yat-sen, Yuan Shikai, Chiang Kai-shek, Mao Zedong? Uh, no, I, um, I haven't studied Mao. Uh, Mao is not um, like um, was is not like Sun Yat Sen. Um, he is, is a much more much more complex, and he was much more of a, of a genius. I mean, you, you, you might call it the evil genius. Mm -hmm. And Sun Yat Sen is very much like what Mading described. In fact, I'm, you know, astonished. The mating at the time was, I mean, he was, she was born in 1898. So 1918, she was, you know, barely in her 20s. But she's very smart. She's got very sharp eye and observation. And Sun yat I mean, if you read his writing, really, you know, it really, it's incredible that for so many years, I mean, I mean, the Chinese world or many in the Chinese world really took what he wrote um, as the Bible. I mean, it was really, uh, you know, quite, if I may say, rubbish. Um, I mean, but he had the um, ability, like Mayling said, uh, to like to hypnotize others. I guess that's also a gift. It's a form of mm. a genius anyway. Mm. But the most important thing about him, um, about his position uh, of becoming the so-called father of China, is that he was the first man to promote republicanism. I mean, that's, that's why he seemed, it, was seem, it seemed quite natural that he was called the father of China, uh, of Republican China. And he was able to, um, to um, promote Republicanism simply because he was in Hawaii. When Hawaii became a republic, it so happened he was there. <clears throat> and he, um, when, when Republic was in on everybody's lips, and he suddenly realized that this was where China could go after it overthrew the Manchu, the Qing dynasty. And nobody else had thought of that because people only knew dynasties, imperial dynasties, royal dynasties, and nobody had thought of Republic China. And he, he thought of this and, and, and he was able to link republicanism with um, nationalism because the Qing dynasty was foreign rule. They were ruled by the Manchus who were regarded as foreigners and foreigners must be overthrown, must be thrown out. And he was able to combine these two and that gave republicanism the momentum. And so China was able to become a republic. In a way, he earned um, Repub he earned his title in this way. I mean, it's just um, um, it just he he didn't uh, anyway. But the many mm. other things about about him. Um, I, I I I I'm hesitating in using the word coward mm. because I think he knew how to preserve himself. I noticed this in Mao. When I, when I was writing the biography of Mao. Mm -hmm. I mean, on the Long March, for example, in all the places Mao stayed, there was always an escape, mm -hmm. a back window, a tunnel, a something. I mean, they knew how to preserve themselves. And this is why, you know, they survived to be the leaders, whereas other people, the braver ones, died. Mm. It's not braver ones. The ones who who were less good at preserving themselves mm. died, mm. and and he was certainly the other adjectives you used about him was mm. certainly true. Mm. And the the other people you mentioned, the Yuan Shikai, 
he was a very able man, Yuan Shikai. Um, um, I think he's been maligned uh, also for um, a century. Mm. Even um, you now, um, he was extremely able. So the Emperor Dowager, he rose under the Emperor Dowager. The Empress Dowager had a very good, big quality, which is her judgment. She could see who she could use for what, and so he used. She used the Yuan Shikai as a major reformer, and this was observed by many foreigners who visited China. At the time, mm -hmm. so um, I mean, there are many books, which is one reason the people, Western powers, didn't want to support Sun Yat-sen to overthrow Yuan Shikai's Beijing government. Um, and Yuan was very, very able, um, and um, and also what we all knew. I mean, everybody who knows China, about China knows that Yuan Shikai tried to make himself an emperor, but most people don't know that. Yuan Shikai <clears throat> renounced the project and returned China to the Republic. So he actually, he had the bottom line. He didn't want to wreck the country, become the emperor um, at whatever cost. Um, in a way, you know, he had some, some morality, some princ principles. Um, mm -hmm. And Chiang Kai shek is um, has many. Chiang Kai shek had many. Um, he was a schemer, and he he broke from Soviet Russia, and so China didn't become communist in 1927. And after he he um, established his government in 1928, he was the first dictator of modern China, but he also rejected communism. So he was not, his regime was not as awful as Mao's regime. He preserved many freedoms which had existed before his rule. And also he, he's, he was, um, he's sought to be close to America, which I mean, of course, during, under his rule, China was, uh, and the later Taiwan was dictatorship. But it was also possible that his son, for his son, to change Taiwan and turn it into a democracy. Mm. We we will soon let the audience uh, ask questions if they have any. But I, I just have a final question, and I'm not going to ask you what your next book will be about. Uh, but I'm going to ask you to reflect a little bit about how it will be to be a biographer in the future. Because I think uh, your book is clearly based on so much meticulous research in archives. You have diaries from Chiang Kai-shek, you have letters. Uh, and now, of course, we know that uh, on one hand, there's so much information about everything on the internet and online. But on the other hand, we actually know so little about, for instance, the leaders uh, of China, about their lives, not to mention the top leaders' wives. We know very little. Uh, and I wonder, are there diaries? Are there letters? Are there, uh, how, how, how will it be to write the biography of China's leaders, or uh, since they are m all of them men, they are all about their wives in, in the future? What do you think? I think um, anything to if the sorry if these um, archives and the documents are in mainland China, and if mainland China continues to be um, like what it is today, then I think there is no hope. I mean, I was very very lucky because in the 1990s, the main years when Zhuang and I were researching our Mao biography, we, we called that window of opening because in Russia, Yeltsin opened the archives, which turned out to be a treasure trove. And Zhuang, my husband, speaks Russian and he spent years working in the Russian archives. Now in mainland China, even though it was after Tiananmen, I still had the freedom of traveling and I was able to interview 200 people who 
were, you know, who knew Mao, who were made historical um, witnesses, and most of them allowed me to tape them, and and if without tape, with making notes, um, and um, and you were able uh, party historians historians were able to publish large, huge quantities of archive materials, um, which were the work of 1980s when you were in China. That was mm -hmm. the period of uh, hope mm -hmm. and openness. Mm -hmm. And all these archivists, the historians, were working away in the mm -hmm. archives and published a lot of volumes of the volumes of, of um, original documents. I mean, there is um, the Long March, the, all the telegram exchanges on the Long March, which went to dozens of volumes. You know, they were very rarely read. Um, but they were really treasure, I mean, treasure of treasures. Now, then, then it, would, it became more difficult um, on this side of the um, millennium. It became more difficult to research um, documents about communists, about the communists. But it was still possible to research Empress Dowager. I mean, the archives um, which had the, the documents of the Qing dynasty um, was open even when I was writing, and then it was some sort that was closed in a, in a semi open um, um, situation. <clears throat> and um, historians, again, were publishing volumes of volumes of documents, you know, like there were 30. Two or was it? You know, I can't remember exact the number of 38, 39 volumes of Li Hongzhang's or his writings. I mean, you know, all the, the court documents were made public. Um, now, now, all well, that's not possible. Research history, in, basically, is is a dead end. It's not no longer possible. I mean, I don't see any fresh documents or research coming from mainland China now. Um, and and um, <clears throat> so, but if you're writing um, about people whose documents are in the US or in Taiwan, I mean, through the years, I can see how Taiwan developed from quite cagey, you know, quite difficult to do research in to very open and quite wonderful, which is wonderful for my last book, because a lot of the things were, documents were in Taiwan. Mm -hmm. And of course, um, if they were in America, so if, it depends on who you are right. Mm -hmm. I mean, in fact, I would like to see some people researching in those 16 years of democracy mm -hmm. in China. Mm -hmm. I mean, the documents are mainly not in main, mainland China. But of course, in the mainland China, there is um, one archive in Nanjing, which has a huge quantities of documents of, of this period. But equally, there were documents in Taiwan, many documents in America, in the, um, you know, I mean, no, nobody has touched them. Mm -hmm. a lot in the law in case of many documents so i think sorry i don't want to make people um pessimistic i think for aspiring um, historians i mean why not right i mean this is a virgin territory i mean you could have great fun there um if you like this sort of thing you can have you can have the most exciting time i mean because everything um every um, you know Mm, uh, arguments you make is new, um, so um, so it, it, that's quite possible. Mm. Thank you very much, Rongzhang. It was uh, very interesting, very nice to talk to you. And I'll give the word to Helena, who is looking at the chat. Yes, uh, thank you both very much. Um, as there does not seem to be any further comments uh, from the audience. So I would just like to invite you to give some final thoughts or some final, share some final thoughts with us, Shung, if you would like. Me? 
Yes, if you, uh, just if you'd like. <laughs> yes. Well, I, I think, I think um, um, Meta, you've asked very good questions. I mean, you know, how different from the usual questions. So I, I think we covered a lot of ground. I mean, I, I'm happy, um, you know, I, I think um, I'm, I'm very happy as, as it is, as the things go. Yeah. I'll say a few things, though. I, I, I can tell you, I could have gone on. I have many, many questions, but I just think <laughs> it, this was uh, about what we had time for. But I would also like to say that uh, I really recommend people to read your book. Uh, and I think for students, for anybody who's interested in China, it's, uh, it's, uh, the, your books have also the strength of being very accessible. Uh, you can read them without uh, without having a lot of knowledge prior to the subject, but you can also read them even if you have a lot of uh, knowledge prior to the subject. And of course, I also have to say that Wild Swans uh, is still recommended <laughs> as a very as a very good book uh, to read. So thank you, thank you a lot. Thank you, thank you very much. Yes. So thank you again to Jung and to Meta for a very insightful presentation and conversation. And thank you to the audience for joining us for this live stream. Uh, I would just like to give some quick information. The Network for Asian Studies is frequently organizing seminars and book talks. Our next seminar is scheduled for Thursday this week and focus on Nepal-India relations. If you are interested in our upcoming events, you can find more information on our website or on Facebook and Twitter at Asia Netwerke. We hope to see you for our future events. And a final thank you to Shung and Mette, and I wish you all a very good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.